Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I never haven't done a Friday podcast before, but I had to do it just because of this special. It is a special episode. Um, my name, I'm your host, Betsy Renteria, live here in Iowa City, Iowa, and of course, streaming all across the world. We've reached 3,600 people, and that's all because of you folks. I can't appreciate. I, I just have no words to just say. Words can't say it, folks. I again, thank you for just spreading the word, getting the link out there, and sharing all of the articles that I post and. Of course, I appreciate my guests that have helped build bridges. And, um, you know, so again, thank you, folks. And please share the link and spread the word right now on your Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, because this is a very important episode. That's why I'm doing this on a Friday. But um, you've sort of just got my um, news on Insta- uh, my little uh post from our- on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. No one was aware of it, but yeah, I've have gotten in contact with uh, an executive producer of the documentary. I'm sure majority of you have seen. And uh, if you have not seen this, uh, it's called An Open Secret. I encourage and I really hope you do watch this. Um, it's one of the most sh- shocking and the most important documentary that I have ever seen. I've seen some from like Zeitgeist and Cartel Land and, you know, among others. And I always share those show those uh, documentaries on this on the show. But to have this gentleman on is really uh, we. I appreciate him joining me, uh, Matthew Valentinos. Um, he's executive producer of the of the documentary Open Secret. Mr. Valentinos, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, and thanks for the kind words. And it's nice to speak to people in Iowa. I've I've been through there a couple times, and I've never met. A bad person from Iowa. It's like a, a very chill state. Cool people, man. Yep, we have our own local communities, and it's everyone knows everyone. And you know, it's like you mentioned. It's uh, there are good people here, and um, I think these good people need to be aware of what you, um, and your crew exposed, and that was Hollywood. I would just have to ask, uh, first of all, what. How did you get involved with this project? I know there's a bunch of interviews out there um, with you on there, but with, for my listeners who are brand new to this subject, may have not heard of you before, uh, just briefly go over how this documentary came about. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm an entertainment lawyer based in, in Boston. I had lived in Los Angeles and worked there for years. Um, and my partner in this was a sole financier, Gabe Hoffman. He's a successful hedge fund manager. And uh, we had went to New York University together, and, you know, we've kept in touch ever since. And we were just batting around doing a, you know, we talk politics and sports all the time. And we were batting around the idea of possibly doing, like, a a boxing documentary. He's a big boxing fan. Uh, And then that turned, you know, I have to give Gabe all the credit. That turned from him saying, you know what, I'd rather just do something that can be helpful and charitable and, and and give, I want to give back because he's, he's been financially successful. And he said, find me something that can help the women, you know, victims of, of sexual abuse for women or children. So that was the mandate he gave me. And that was way back probably in 2011. Uh, and then I went around for about six months to a year pitching different documentary producers or trying to put together different ideas about how we could do that best because the subject matter obviously has been covered a lot already. Um, but, you know, we focused on Hollywood, not because we wanted to bash Hollywood, but because you, we wanted to reach just beyond the typical documentary, uh, audience and, and Hollywood's international. People are interested in Hollywood. We knew big names would be involved. We knew we could shoot all of it in Los Angeles. You don't really make a lot of money in documentaries. We pretty much even budgeted this to lose money, but we thought we'd at least try and aim to get our money back and, and, and appeal to an international audience and Hollywood would be that way. And we knew we could shoot there. And then I also knew that there was plenty of subject matter there. Gabe didn't know that so much early on, but our initial start to this was, okay, let's do an investigation. So we sort of had a development budget of about a hundred thousand dollars. And then we approached Amy Burke, who had directed uh, Deliver Us From Evil, which is a 2006 documentary, which she was Oscar nominated for, about a very similar subject matter, exposing the, you know, the 
Catholic Church pedophile scandal. And she's based in Los Angeles, and and then and I love that documentary uh, just because you know how she was able to draw out the pedophile's emotions and the victim's emotions and get everyone to talk about it. And I thought she'd be perfect for this, and she was. And uh, once you know we reached out to her, and then we initially did an investigation. We hired some investigators. Uh, they did their own research as well, and once we got back the information, we realized, okay, there's definitely enough here to put together a documentary, because it's a hard subject to figure out how you're actually going to shoot the documentary. Sure, you can talk about sexual abuse, but the toughest part is actually getting people to talk. And this is sort of, we didn't want it to be exploitive, and we didn't want it to be tabloid. And that's another reason why we brought in Amy, but look, at the end of the day, people, you need you need to get people's interest because there's there's a lot of stuff for people out there to watch. So we knew that we were going to need to get some people on camera. Um, and that's very hard to do for several reasons because as people are finally learning over the last five or six years since this information has been out there, it takes victims a long time to actually come to terms with their abuse. So a lot of the people that we were approaching who might be in their 20s or early 30s now still can't talk about it. Um, that's why you're seeing like a lot of claims from 30 or 40 years ago are the ones that are sort of being argued in court, like with, with Bill Cosby or, or with the recent, uh, you know, Larry Nasser case up in Michigan, that guy was doing that for decades. So it takes a long time for this stuff to come out. And it also took us a long time to sort of develop the relationships with these, with these survivors in the film to really come forward. And also you need to develop a trust with them so that they can, share their information with you and they and then you also have to let them know that you know you're going to get this information out there and that you're going to protect them um and that we're going to do this right legally and 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 gabe gave us the ability to do that because this was very well financed we hired the best attorneys in the business you know we had a great great crew working on this um and it really was a wonderful opportunity to make a great film and and the last part of it was what we kind of built into our marketing plan or what we thought was going to happen was what you're seeing now with the Me Too movement. We figured once we expose this in Hollywood, Hollywood will be shocked and appalled and will want to do something to change it and will support us and we'll get behind this film, much like they did with the Me Too movement or Time's Up and all that. But I think we were too early and I think... Sex, child sexual abuse is even stigmatized worse than, you know, what's going on with adult sexual abuse and how women are being treated. So uh, that's sort of it in a nutshell about how we came about this idea and and where we are today with it. And, you know, I'm happy to answer further questions. Now, regarding the documentary, um, how did you like, – uh, well – I, I guess that wouldn't be how did you is um, what was the when I watched that documentary, Michael Hara was someone that sort of just. Um, what was your thoughts? I don't really want to like, what did you think of that part of the documentary when you watched it? And really, you just you, you, it leaves well, me speechless. Us, that was it, it, it was fantastic. Right. I mean, I remember the day we got the news of that. Uh, disarming films that Amy's company called us up and, and was like, you would not believe what Michael Hara just said, right? Because we, that interview was shot at SAG after headquarters, which I think is right there on Wiltshire. They had their own PR person there. Um, and, you know, we have, I have the 45 minute full entire interview of that, which is a documentary in itself. I mean, it's, it's just, slowly seeing what's coming out of his mouth is amazing. Um, and we went into that interview already knowing that he had basically admitted to being inappropriate with one of his other clients in the film, uh, Joey C., uh, mm -hmm. from, from a prior interview. But both of those, those interviews were months apart, and that's how long these things take. So it can be very, very frustrating. So when they click anyone that's ever worked on a documentary knows that feeling of ah this was worth it because those are the moments that are very very hard to get and when it comes to this 
this subject matter, a lot of what you can put in a documentary would never be seen in a court of law, right? So there's always what lawyers see or what judges see or what they or what they put out of cases, exclude from evidence. At least as a documentary filmmaker, you're able to put in a little more. And that being said, what we did put in there, while it's all 100% validated, and true, and protected, there was so much more that we could have put in, but we just wanted to stick to the facts and not have conjecture. And we also knew that we were taking on some, some pretty powerful people and organizations that want to quiet all of this. So we didn't want to give them an inch to come after us and, 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 and fight us in court with some sort of false defamation claim or, 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 you know, something like that. That, that's why what's in there is, is really just a small fraction of what we know. And, we did that on purpose because it's indisputable and it's, and, and because we wanted it to, to be the beginning, not the end of this issue, we, you know, and, and finally it has been because now there's new investigations going on. A lot more victims are starting to reach out to us the last, you know, year, year and a half. A lot more reporters are finally waking up, you know, I guess you could call it the mainstream media, whatever you want to call it is very, very slow to reality in this country right now. Uh, I think they're easily distracted by politics, and a lot of the newspapers don't have the budgets for these things. So people like documentary filmmakers, we're filling in the holes on these stories, right? And now that this is like a base that we're hoping will be a launching point for large organizations to start doing their own investigations because there is ample territory as have we seen since really this started to take off again in November or October when, when Harvey Weinstein came out because that seemed to finally be enough that people were like, all right, maybe there's something to it. And because it was about women and famous women, it got a lot more notoriety. You know, some of the people in our film, they're not that famous. They're also, you know, young boys. And I don't think people seem to care as much. Um, but once you have some famous star come out and say, Harvey Weinstein raped me, now that's more of a story. But behind that, you'll see that there's a lot of connections to those people and that lifestyle and that culture of power in Hollywood. And that's what we were trying to expose. Because Hollywood is just like every other institution, right? And that's another reason why we chose Hollywood, because we wanted to show how this is an institutional problem. This is happening right there in Iowa. There could be some coach or there could be some school teacher or somebody who works with kids and, you know, a music teacher, whatever it is, who's doing, I guarantee you something is going on in Iowa City right now on a larger level than you can imagine of kids being victimized and is being protected by some sort of institution. Just like you saw, uh, that the, the conductor, um, Levine at, 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 in, in Manhattan opera there. Right. And he was here up in Boston for a while. Uh, now he's bringing a defamation case that, 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 you know, he's being defamed while, while there, everyone else is claiming we've, we've known for 30 years that he was sexually abusing people. So we knew that with Hollywood, this, this could happen. And we hoped that Hollywood would turn on itself much like it has with the Me Too movement and start exposing this. And, what I can report is that it is slowly. There's far fewer, you know, not as much, nearly as much support as we wanted, but there finally is some investigations going on. I can tell you uh, that there's a large, well funded magazine investigation going on right now that I think is going to expose a lot more of this. It's also going to be in detail about. Us specifically, and some of the some of the problems that we've had to deal with, and some of the influences that we were up against, and also some of the methods that were used against this film to silence it. You know, pe people might just say, "Oh, that's just a conspiracy theory." But when you're when you see that Harvey Weinstein was hiring, you know, former Mossad agents to get information on people to keep quiet, and, and you see how he uses his PR people and how he uses big law firms to silence people or, and, and, and get NDAs signed. Well, we, we're up against that world right now. So it's very interesting. And, uh, 
it can be a little scary at times, but I think we know the information that we have is that the truth can't be denied and it's going to come out. Yeah, the mention of Harvey Weinstein having former Mossad agents, he's just, that's just one individual that has that type of power. And there's much more out there that have more money and more, more power than him in Hollywood. So it Absolutely. really does hit the tip of the iceberg there. Um, but, you know, the one individual. Just, just to give you a suggestion of, you know, a lot of the people that maybe turned this film down or didn't want to get involved with it. I remember we went to Bill O'Reilly's people. This was before we knew about Bill O'Reilly's uh, cases and before he was fired, you know, from Fox. For and, and their people, their response was, America doesn't want to know about sexual abuse, right? And that was Bill O'Reilly and Fox News, right? And, and uh, they didn't care. And then we went to CNN because we have hours and hours and hours of, and far more footage that can be investigated and properly vetted and that they could eat on stories for this for months. And I remember at the time, we, we were going to hand over everything to CNN, and this was before the film even really came out. And we just said, you know, they were all, they'd rather show that. Remember when that plane got shot down, that MH70 over Ukraine that the Russians shot down? Well, they just wanted to do that type of coverage, right? They didn't want to, they didn't want to be interested in this. Um, and that's what we're up against with, with, with large news organizations on television, because they're all about ratings. They're not really about, actually investigating and they're also all about limiting their liability so if there's anything in a story that they could potentially cause them problems frankly they avoid it and i'm not blaming this on the reporters i'm blaming it more at the editor editor stage at the newspapers or the you know executive producer stage at the networks and you saw that with ronan farrow i mean he's probably going to win a pulitzer prize for what he did with that weinstein article and he couldn't get it out mm -hmm. you know and he he couldn't even get it on MSNBC where he was an employee. It's ridiculous. And that's what we're facing. So that's why we posted this on Vimeo. Um, I was up at a television festival in Vermont when that news broke. And I just called up Gabe and I said, Gabe, let's just put this up on Vimeo right now to support everyone who's saying these things about, about Harvey Weinstein. Because we know it's, we know that there's a lot of interest there now and that, that'll, It'll sort of reignite the interest in this documentary, and it and it did, and it's sort of been a whirlwind since that November. <laughs> Man, uh, it's. I guess the uh, one question I, I'm really interested in, and when this individual Brock Pierce, uh, the you said Hollywood's really slow. The media is really slow at getting at these people. Well, uh, one of my, um, I've had their manager and editor. Um, Ethan Lyle on, uh, this is from Disobedient Media, the um, late night show host John Oliver told his audience during a uh, attack on the pro, it's an attack seg segment called the pro-establishment pro uh, broadcast, he actually told everyone to Google the Brock Pierce scandal, and um, again, the same, exactly. the same website. Notice, notice how he said, but... I give him a lot of courage for doing that. Um, and I'm glad that, you know, it, it's sad that it takes something like that to get this information out there. We've put this information out there since 2014. But even in that situation, I guarantee you the reason why John Oliver said, just Google Brock Pierce scandal, that's all I'm going to say about that. It wasn't to save time on camera. It was because he had a room full of lawyers who just said, this is all you can say about it. OK. Yeah. Um, and they were probably, you know, the clearance attorneys were being like, what's satire? What's true? This is a wealthy dude. We've got to be careful what we say about him. This is involving our industry. Then there's people behind him that might come after us or the show. So that's why he said that, just to get the word out. And really, the people who are at the forefront of this thing right now are documentary filmmakers and comedians. Comedians are really the forefront of free speech in this country. I mean, you know, and podcasts like this, like a, like a show like the Joe Rogan show, where they're talking about things just off the cuff and they're letting things out and, and you're hearing reporter, you know, 
comedians talk about things because at least they feel safe there and, and they can hide behind satire to a bit. I mean, that's how the Bill Cosby thing happened was, was, was through Hannibal Burris. And, um, you know, I bet you, you know, in the sixties and the seventies, it was more musicians. Uh, but today I think it's comedians and, and we're seeing how the media, especially, you know, print media, which used to investigate all this stuff has been dying since the mid nineties since digital technology. So one of the downsides of digital technology is that the big budgets for news stories like this are going away. One of the upsides is people like you and I can talk and disseminate this to millions of people. But the downside is we don't have the marketing money or the PR influence that some of the larger networks still do. Right? And 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 if you're really trying to speak truth to power, the downside is money money cares more about power than it does about truth and until we switch that around that's that this story is still going to be hampered and that's why we chose this subject because we figured other than murdering somebody and and frankly i think this may, may even be worse than murdering somebody is child abuse we figured sexual abuse pedophilia of children who could defend this or who could look the other way we figured once we started exposing some of these people, people would be quick to jump on that and 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 speak out against it. But we're not seeing that uh in the numbers that we thought just yet. So apparently there's a lot of people who will protect pedophilia. Well, yeah, it's it, like you said, it's still going it's mentioned it's still going on today. Um you probably if you are aware that the uh glee actor Mark Salling had twenty five thousand images of young children and and when he and this all came out the day he uh passed away at 35 years old earlier this year so yeah uh, and look we were on that from the beginning and you know i don't want to get into conspiracy theories but he hung himself from a tree or whatever was the case and i'd like to know what homeland security investigations that they're the ones that really head up child porn um on the federal side you know what they're sitting on because I guarantee you Mark Salling was probably not the highest guy in that child pedophile group, right? Mm -hmm. He was just the low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, he just fell into their laps. Uh, and I, 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 I really, really hope that there's some sort of investigation going on tracking that whole entire group that, that, that had that information because you know, they, they put this stuff up in, in, in clouds with encryption. But if you can figure out who else is in that crew, it's it's going to really open this up. And I'm, I got to believe that the the FBI, Homeland Security, hopefully LAPD, is actually doing some sort of investigation right now on that because they they have to be because there's pressure. There's finally pressure on them from the public to bring cases. You're seeing in New York, the District Attorney Cyrus Vance is being pressured to bring case against Harvey Weinstein, but he hasn't yet. Even NYPD is pushing him. We've, we've pers I've personally been in touch with LAPD about a couple subjects. Um, and I know they finally created a task force to, to get this moving. But the one thing about Los Angeles is that's obviously a company town. I mean, it might be one of the biggest cities in America, but when it comes to Hollywood, that's, you know, I mean, Hollywood tech weapons out there are the, are the biggest industries. So it, I'm not saying it's like a the whole, you know, LA is built around protecting Hollywood. It's, it's not as open as that, but I think the culture there to a degree it's, it is, it's easier to be dismissive of attacks against Hollywood when you're living in Los Angeles, because you know, all the, you know, somebody you know works at one of the studios or the networks or works in entertainment and people want to protect the industry. And sometimes they see this as an attack against the industry. And if anything, we're not trying to attack Hollywood. We're just trying to get some of these people in it that are doing damage to it and controlling Hollywood in a way that is damaging Hollywood, holding back creative talent. Think of all the people's careers that have been stunted and ruined because of drug abuse, and suicide, and, and mental abuse because of these situations. And look at the type of people that have been in power, like Harvey Weinstein. I mean, people call him a genius, but think of 
think of how terrible he, he was and how many great films he probably ruined and careers he prevented just because he was more concerned with with himself and his own power, right? We've got to remove the power base and, and that's built around shame and sexual abuse in Hollywood. And it's it's like a it's pervasive in every industry, I'm sure, but Hollywood is one that is, is the most exaggerated because it has the most people going there who are seeking fame, and after money, fame even more than money, fame is you know we all know it's like a drug, and uh, access and and putting somebody in a movie is what has been used. And now we just need the industry. Our goal was to get the industry to start policing itself better. And we figured the best way to do that was to start with children. And what's been disappointing is, especially with the Me Too movement, they're talking about women. But we still haven't had one big real Hollywood person talk about the children. I mean, Corey Feldman is the one guy that's out there. Uh, but I'm talking like an A-list, mm -hmm. like Tom Hanks person come forward or somebody like that. You know, Brad Pitt come forward, Leonard DiCaprio come forward, you know, a big a big director like Chris Nolan or somebody like that come forward and say, Yes, this is happening and we need to stop it. This is ridiculous and let's 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 change this. Just like uh at the Oscars where Francis McDormand said, you know, we should do inclusion riders and that seems to everyone seems to jump on board of that because no one wants to come across as racist or Exclude, you know, excluding women from their film crews. We need someone to say the same thing about we need better child protection on on film sets because right now they're not really being enforced. The laws that are there to pr protect kids. You think that Hollywood will soon lose, lose its power because of the independent media and now just the easy access to the technology and you know, I mean, iPhones can produce good looking you know films do you think with the technology that the uh middle the middleman and the uh, flyover states you think it's it's going to be our time and hollywood will just continue to disintegrate no not yet no um uh, because you're not really the one thing hollywood is is great at is distribution and look it, it still is the best play the, the best talent is still in hollywood only when it's it's when talent decides Talent will decide that industry, where the industry goes, not not the not the studios. And right now, talent still wants to work with the studios. Where I think the biggest difference could be between digital and studios, between San Francisco and LA, in terms of is Google gonna be be the better than Warner Brothers, or is Google just gonna buy Warner Brothers, right? And it's more gonna be about what are Apple, Netflix, Amazon, and Google gonna do, and and are their cultures going to overtake the studio cultures? And I think that's where the change will come. But the question is, is the same thing happening in the Googles and the Amazons and the Netflixes? Because you saw Amazon fire their head head guy, uh, Roy Price, a couple months ago, right? Mm -hmm. You've seen some other scandals. You know, We're hearing whispers about how bad this is in Silicon Valley, maybe not to the degree of child sexual abuse, but, you know, to the is sexual abuse with women and, and how much of a male dominated industry that is. So the short answer is, do I think that there's going to be any change in terms of content getting out there in a better way? Not in the short term, no. And, and Hollywood still has its influence. And what I think is going to happen is it's going to be a generational thing because there's a lot of people who are still in creative, decision, you know, power making decisions. Who, while they may be innocent, um, or they likely are innocent, you know, I'm sure 98% of the industry is in innocent. They may have worked with somebody who isn't. They don't want that stain on their record, so they'd rather just keep it quiet, as opposed to doing any, you know, and maybe fire the guy quietly or not pick up his next show. And I think the industry will slowly filter out these problems because if you've been following the trades, if you've been following the progress. Um, You've been seeing a lot of big show executive producers just lose their jobs. You just saw Louis C.K.'s career was done and over a night. Uh, I'd like to think that our film had something to do with Brian Singer, you know, name being taken off a whole bunch of shows at Fox and, and losing his his uh, ability to finish directing Bohemian Rhapsody. So, though I'm sure his own 
personal actions were far more influential in Fox making that decision than anything we did. But I think they're finally slowly waking up to the realization that, you know, the public's opinion can affect things. And where you're seeing a great example of that is in Snap, right? When Rihanna comes out just yesterday shaming Snap, their stock goes down. That's where that's where this is going to change, right? When it starts hitting stock, when it starts hitting the stock of Sony or the stock of Warner Brothers um, or the stock of Netflix, because it turns out they hired some, a major child molester or a sexual abuser in one of their major shows, and people get upset about that. That's that's how they're starting to look at things. Like, how is this going to hit our bottom line? Because that's the only way you can get Hollywood to change. You, you're not going to get them to change morally, but you're going to get them to change when it affects the bottom line. And their ability to cover up stuff with social media is harder than it was maybe back in the 30s when it, you know, when, when they could have gotten away with these things and they controlled the press and they controlled PR and they controlled the unions. So that's the short answer is as the public becomes more empowered through social media to express their approval and make financial decisions, that's where I think this who's in movies and what movies are about and who the studios hire is, is will be changed. Um, can you give us an update on these individuals like Mark Collins rector or Chad Shackley or Marty Rice, Marty Weiss or Brian Peck or any one, any of these guys, or do you have any other, uh, investigations that you can possibly touch on or give us some insight of what's going on with you? Well, with Brian Singer, um, on Oscar night, we released a, a little trailer of one of Brian's former, um, I guess you would call it boyfriends, you know, who pleaded with Brian to, to, to lead making some change in the industry, right? Because Brian Singer is connected to or friends with a lot of the people that we point out in our documentary who happen to be convicted pedophiles or accused pedophiles. So what I can tell you about that is we did an in-depth interview. His name's Brett S. I actually just spoke with him today. He's a brave young man. Um, and I think when we release that interview, that's going to open up a whole new can of worms. Because what we're able to show is that this is not just like a bunch of random one-offs of child abusers, that this is an organized network, it's a criminal conspiracy. This is like organized crime. And there's a hierarchy to it. And it's like a functioning system. And there's a lot of different fronts. And there's a lot of people who who, who go out and scout these, you know, the young children that, that they're going to abuse. And then they sort of pass them up the line and introduce them through, through, uh, different methods to people. And then what really keeps people silent, what's really keeping people in the industry silent are that there are really at some of these parties, private parties, groups of people in the same room together committing acts of pedophilia. And if you're not, you have to say that you want to do that and that you're okay with it to be in that room. And if you're not, then you don't go in the room. But once you're in the room and you do that, it's almost like a, that's like being a made man in a mafia or something. Now you're in like a secret society. Now you're going to go down for the rest of your life if any of that news comes out. And even if you change your mind or you want to be quiet about it, or you, I mean, you want to talk about it, you're not going to because A, everyone else in that room is going to deny it. And B, you're, you're already guilty by implication. Right. And and you're going to lose the moral high ground of saying, hey, I was in a room and, and we all raped this kid together. Um, everyone's going to look at you like you're a scumbag and no one's going to believe, you know, your your credibility's already shot. And not to mention that the people you did it with probably have more money than you or more power than you. And they hold this over you. So suicide is, is might be the best way out mm. or drug abuse is often the best way out. And that's why you're seeing so many suicides, so many people die. And it's, you know, a lot of the people who are sexually abused, they end up 
you know, dying of drug overdoses in their 30s, because that's when they're finally coming to t- realizing what happened to them in their teens. That's why you're seeing so many screwed up child stars. It's not that they love drugs, it's that they're using the drugs to self-medicate, and that they can't go to anyone for help. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing how complicit the industry is. We're seeing how agents were sending out their clients to known sexual abusers and, and looking the other way, and how that's been going on for decades. Everyone looks the other way because it's just, oh, that's how the industry is. But now we got to change it. It's up to us. It's up to our generation to, to, to change it. And it's up to the institutions that we have in place, you know, law enforcement. It's tough for law enforcement because a lot of this is he said, she said. And even in our documentary, the two best things that we have in our documentary that reveals the confessions, they couldn't be used in a court of law. You know, statute of limitations is something that's finally starting to change. It's something that we push push for, right? You're seeing Michigan change it now because of the Larry Nasser case. Uh, you've seen some other states change it because of the Catholic Church thing. But before, they used to hide behind statute of limitations. And, and you can argue that sometimes statute of limitations were even put in to benefit people like pedophiles. And, even, and, and then another thing we're really pushing on is mandatory minimum sentencing. For some reason, if you're a drug dealer, I I work a lot in true crime. I have clients who are pretty big drug dealers, and they'll get 20 years in prison. But if you're you're a child abuser, you'll get a year, and you're out in six months. And I, you know, and and I think that these child abusers they need to be put away for longer periods of time um, than they're doing, and they're just kind of pushed through the system. And sexual abuse, it's so common. That I think that's why the part of the reason why the courts do it is because if they locked up every sexual abuser for a long period of time, the jails would be overloaded. Uh, this is a bigger problem than drugs. This is in every town in the country. And it's something that we as a country have to address and say. And that's what we're trying to do with this film is we're trying to raise awareness of it so we can remove the stigma of shame and put the power into the hands of survivors. And the shame needs to go on these people that are doing it because we're never going to stop pedophilia. I, you know, I think it's like a mental disease. Spoke with many doctors about it. A lot of these pedophiles, most of them can't stop, right? That's why you see a lot of them, they're recidivists. So, do you think that they were, do you believe they were abused when they were young? I think a lot of them were. Most of them probably were. I don't think all of them are, though. Yeah. you know, it's like a serial killer. It's, it's something's just wrong in their brain. And, and that's another thing we have going for us is that they can't stop, right? So even if they did something that we know about 10 years ago or 20 years ago and they're denying it, it's been covered up, you know what? Their compulsion is still going to be able to do it. And what's happened since our film is that We've noticed these networks have gotten a lot more sophisticated about covering up how they communicate, how they interact, and how they do this. But they can't, but they still can't stop it, right? So a lot of the information that we have is sort of pre-2014 because they were so cocky, they were so arrogant, and they thought that no one was watching, that there was just a lot of information out there that we now have that is going to and that still falls within statutes of limitations that is really going to show these connections um, and put these organizations in some peril. And it's just a question of, we recently tried to put together a petition for a national commission on this, which you have to do through the president's office. Um, I think our PR rollout could have been smarter about it. Uh, Gabe, Gabe posted it. And I think by March 23rd, we have to have a million signatures or 100,000 signatures, and we're not going to make that. Um, we're going to have to redo it again and be smarter about it. I think it was Gabe's heart was in the right place, but we didn't roll it out smart enough. But really, what we need in this country is a national commission on this, because that's what will get the public's attention. Um, and it's worked in, 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 in England. It's worked in Australia. And we've seen change from national commissions. This shouldn't be a state-to-state thing. Like, Michigan shouldn't have to take the forefront on on limiting statute of limitations because of just what happened with that Dr. Nasser guy. Like, that should be a federal thing. 
and all the states should be involved. And this needs to be a national conversation. We have national conversations about about healthcare. We have national conversations about drugs, but we've never had a national conversation about sex abuse. And it, and it's so pervasive, and it affects so many people. We need to, and and um, that's that's kind of where we're hoping this this goes in the next four or five years. Well, I can just say tell you this, my myself and my listeners are definitely going to support you all this all the way, and we are so grateful just to have you on the show. Um, is there is um, I appreciate you again coming on. Um, is there any final words? for my listeners? Yeah, I mean, if there are any, if this reaches somebody who's who's been sexually molested, I would ask them to report it. You know, I understand that it's hard to, to do. And a lot of these people that are abused, they're abused because they're the most vulnerable. They might come from a broken family. They, you know, there's some reason these, these, these predators, these sexual predators, they're very smart about who they pick, and that's another battle we're facing. Is we have so many people who want to come forward, but they're afraid of of publicly saying anything because they, don't, you know, they're like, well, it might upset my family if they know this, or no one's going to believe me, or I'm scared what people are going to think about me. And unfortunately, that's like ninety percent of the people that we have, and it's not our position to out them. So. For every one person that come, is brave enough to come out and say anything, there's hundreds or thousands that they're speaking up for. And the more that start to speak up, that's where the change is going to come from. So if someone's out there, I would say, get a lawyer, go to the police station, get a psychiatrist. Don't be afraid to start dealing with it because once you do, it will get better. And if you don't deal with it, I'm not a doctor, but if you don't deal with it, I think it's only going to get worse. And there are places, there's people like us out there. If there's anyone out there that's listening to this who's been molested in the industry, feel free to reach out and contact us because many people are doing that now. And we're, 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 we're doing more interviews. We're putting together more videos. We're, you know, we're in touch now with a, with a network of trusted reporters and, and, and journalists. And also we can put you in touch with, we can help guide you and put you in touch with you know, where to go in terms of reporting things criminally. Um, there's criminal cases that can be brought. There's civil cases that, that can be brought. And even if you don't want to bring a criminal or civil case, as long as what you're saying is the truth, you can still get it out there. And let the truth get out there. And there's there's people that will support you, and an and, and open secret is, is one of them. Um, I would advise people to just to watch our Twitter feed Go on to our YouTube page. It's at Add an Open Secret on YouTube, and we've got plenty of videos there. Uh, watch the film on Vimeo. Do some research on the Digital Entertainment Network. That's sort of what our film is based around to a large degree. And you will go down this rabbit hole on YouTube and Google that you will find the evidence that you are searching, and you will get your own answers. You will see that this isn't some weird conspiracy theory. This, you know, we're not. This is this is real, and the power of the truth. Is hopefully, going to do something about it. But for us, we just keep pushing forward because it can be depressing at times when you're seeing little inaction, or there can be, you know, we have our other lives. Gabe runs a hedge fund. Um, you know, run my own law office. We have our own personal lives, obviously. But this is something neither of us have given up on. And we're just trying to pass it on to people and organizations that can do a lot with it more than we can. Um, and we're finally starting to break through that. And I think in the next three to six months, you're going to see us passing this off to those types of organizations. That's what I can tell you is larger organizations are finally starting to respond to us in a way that they want us to start assisting with them. And they understand what we're trying to accomplish. And they understand that there's more that they can do. So that's the good news. The good news is. There's going to be a lot more information coming out, and there's going to be a lot more larger institutions, whether it's, it's political or government or publishing, that are going to be sort of taking this on. And we're going to be able to pass the baton, because that's all we want to do, is pass the baton to people who can do more with this information than we can. We've just been trying to keep the flame alive. 
Well, we'll continue as listeners and supporters to continue well, to help you light that flame. And uh, again, you are seriously our heroes because of what you touch on. And it definitely needs to be aware of because it's one of the most it's one of the most disturbing things you could and one of the most in, inhumane things i mean these people that we speak of or have to have they have no conscience i don't know how anyone could want to do these type of activities with young children i know some people that are listening might not want to hear this conversation but you know if you just turn away this action these actions will continue and it'll continue to manifest to where it's going to get crazier if we don't talk about it um but Mr. Valentinus, I thank you so much for joining me tonight. And uh, please give out your uh, social media platforms for everyone to check you out again one more time. Yeah, you, Twitter, you can reach us on Twitter at, at an open secret and on Facebook. I think we've got about 11,000 Twitter followers. We'd like to get it up to 50,000. Um, on Facebook, we've got about 30,000, and that's at an open secret doc on Facebook, and that's where we post a lot of videos too. And then our YouTube channel, is at an open secret, you know, this YouTube channel at an open secret. I think we might have a thousand subscribers. We'd like to get that up to more, but trust me, the views are more than the subscribers. A lot of people are even afraid to subscribe because they don't want those connections back to them. But the number of hits that our videos are getting and our interviews are getting, there is a, a major interest in this. And, you know, we're also planning on putting the film taking it off of Vimeo and getting it onto a major platform in the next month or two. Um, that's really Gabe's call. And I've been pressuring him. I, I wanted this up on Netflix six months ago. Uh, but Gabe also is really, Gabe is far deeper into this than I am because uh, once he's like a pit bull and once he latches his teeth onto something, he doesn't quit. And he's really deep into some of his own investigations with this subject matter. And I know he has his own personal strategy that he hasn't even informed me about because we're worried about people tapping our phones or breaking into our social email. So we're not even communicating unless it's face to face about certain things that I'm really excited about because I know Gabe will get it done right. And, 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 uh, that's another thing that I'm really looking forward to. Um, so just in terms of the audience that there is for this, documentary we had about just between pirated versions and what we put out on vimeo we're at like five to six million and that's with no pr and nothing so i think where you're really going to see some changes once we get this up on an amazon or a netflix we're going to see anywhere from 10 to up to 50 million people finally watching this you know over a period of two or three months and and it's amazing we're so familiar with the subject matter that we think the whole world knows but the world doesn't know, you know, they even as much news and as interviews as we've done, the world still doesn't know. And it's still so many distractions out there that once it finally does hit a major platform, I think we're going to hit have another tidal wave of information come on to us. That'll be a hundred times, a thousand times greater than what we've had right now. So that's and all of that is finally going to happen in 2018. You know, this has been a seven year venture for us, but we're really just this is still at the beginning. This, you know, it's not the end. And what keeps us going is we'll just get a random phone call every now and then or a random email. Somebody who drops a bomb on us about something or about someone that just keeps feeding us because we know we're on to the right thing. So have faith is what I would I would tell your tell your audience and, and just do your own investigation. The power of personal knowledge is, is what's going to change this. And don't be afraid to be active and don't be afraid to speak up. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Mr. Valentinus, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I hope everything goes well, and I can't wait for uh, your future projects, sir. All right, well, thanks. Thanks for having us. All right, thank you very much. You have a good one, sir. You too. Bye. Well, there he goes, folks. Um, man, that was a very... That's a very... That's a man in the fight right there. These are the people that... I would consider heroes. They are heroes because of what they just, what he just talked about in his partner game. You know, I hope everyone shares this, in, this information, shares this episode, spreads the link, follow these guys and watch the documentary. If you haven't, or share that Vimeo link to give to your friends, family, anyone that is interested or a little hesitant 
because they're, you know, or they don't want to believe, or someone who doesn't believe it. You just need to give it to them regardless of how they feel about watching it. So, but I would speak more, but I have to get to work. I have to get to work at five o'clock here. But um, I appreciate him joining me. And um, folks, I appreciate you joining the conversation. Um, please share the link. Like I said, spread the word. We're gaining more listeners by the day. And it's all because of you folks. So again, please share the link, spread the word. I'll be on this Sunday evening at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time with CJ Westfall. Um, looking forward to having him on. Please tune in and have a good weekend, folks. And have a great St. Patty's Day.